Annotation is one of the most important things in Smash, but also one of the more difficult ones because what exactly should cause you to adapt and how should you adapt? A lot of people adapt intuitively, which is not a bad thing, but today I'll be explaining some concepts, some theory, some ideas, and give you some practical examples of ways to make your adaptation more specific, more effective using counter strategies. What are you trying to tell me? That I can dodge bullets? Trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. Counter strategies is a theoretical concept that basically says that a strategy has a strategical counter as well, right? So if we see Steve going for his standard strategy, then we should be able to counter that on a strategical level rather than having to hard read what he does. Today, I'll be giving you an example of exactly how to beat Steve or how to create a counter strategy towards Steve's standard strategy. And then we extrapolate some of these ideas to make them more generic so that you can apply them to any matchup. The idea is that instead of playing an RPS where it's like attack, beats, grabs, grabs, beats, shields, where it's very specific, instead we're thinking about what the opponent intends to do and we try to counter them based on their intentions. This can be as generic or as specific as you'd like to be and we're gonna go deeper into that in today's video. Everyone, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It shows me that you like to see more of this type of content and let's get into this week's video. Everyone, please enjoy. For those who don't know what counter strategies are, so counter strategies is basically a strategy designed to beat uh, an opposing strategy. I was like, rip my battery, that's fair enough. In other words, it's, it, it's, it's basically 50% of what you're doing at all times. Now, there are two types of counter strategies. There are generic counter strategies. And there are specific counter strategies. Generic counter strategies are all about like generic adaptation. So these are things that are more related to, for example, st uh, uh, for example, stage positioning. Hang on. For example, stage positioning related or uh, timing related, right? So some an example of like a counter strategy is that like your strategy revolves around uh, negating the way your opponent corners you, which is general. Like this, this is overall, it's pretty generic. Right? Like, it, it, the way you get cornered, those dynamics are very universal and they apply to multiple different characters. So, for example, the way you counter the way a Cloud corners you and the way you counter the way that, like, a, um, I don't know, Lucina or even something more specific like a Pac-Man, the way that you counter their cornering is generally universally applicable. Okay? So that's when we think about generic counter strategies. So those, those, like, we'll talk a, a little bit about, but they're a little bit easier to figure out, right? Specific counter strategies are more about, you know, like, how do I deal with specific, uh, you know, specific moves, slash sets of moves, slash ideas, right? So this is TLDR what a counter strategy is. So when you think about counter strategy, you think about, okay, it's a st strategy meant to counter something specific. That's why it's called a counter strategy. When should you employ a counter strategy versus just forcing your own game plan? Yeah, that's a really good thing to, to talk about. So. I'll write it down, right? When to force your game plan and when to rely on counter strategies. And we'll talk about that as we as we get through today's points, okay? So let's start off with the first step to figuring out your counter strategy and we'll do this using specific examples, okay? So the first step to figuring out your counter strategy is to understand opportunity costs. And this is also where we get to the hardest part of our under, of our counter strategies. So understanding opportunity costs is basically like what is the opponent sacrificing by uh, you know by uh, executing this strategy. So let's go towards our example, which is going to be Steve. Okay, so we'll talk about how to set create a Steve counter strategy. Okay, so step one: understanding opportunity cost. Okay. So in that sense, what we got to figure out versus Steve is two things. So one is, you know, the mining, mining aspect. And he, uh, he uses uh, his tools to disengage out of bad situations. Okay. So this is basically like the, the two parts that we're going to look at. There is, there is more to think about in terms of um, his strategy, like for example, his disadvantage as well as some of his ledge traps but generally these are like the two things that people struggle with right the fact that he mines and then he disengages with like an iron or 
um, you know, like um, a dash tag, a dash grab, minecart, etc., etc. So, what does this opportunity cost you mining? There's two things that are very important about the mining aspect. So, one is that he sacrifices uh, control over his positioning. So, he can move while mining, but it's less significant than before, right? And the other thing to keep in mind is that, like, every mining sequence uh, incurs lag. And it's not a lot of lag, but it's enough lag to say, like, if he's busy mining you with something, he's probably not going to be fast enough to whiff punish it. Okay? So, when he's mining, we got to make sure of these two... We got to make use of these two weaknesses. But for now, we'll get into that later. For now, we just got to understand these are some opportunity costs of what he's doing. Now, for his other tools, let's first get an idea of what his tools are. Right, so he has dash attack, uh, he has dash grab, he has minecart, and, well, I think those are the main ones that he used to get out of a bad spot, right? He, he could do, like, you know, you could argue down air, but he usually doesn't, doesn't go high enough to, um, to do that. And then, of course, there's something like roll, right? So if you think about, like, dash attack, this is usually, like, um, pretty good move, but dash attack is also, um, and if you look at the frame data, you can see it's pretty safe, right? It's gonna be, like, minus 10-ish. Um, right, so minus 10 with diamond without is a little bit less safe, but it's also frame 8, which is really fast. So dash tag, the thing about dash tag that is very important to understand is that while this is, this looks like really good frame data, this is definitely like always, almost always, uh, grabbable because of the way that he lunges forward, right? So generally like, uh, very weak versus shield. I would say because grab is a pretty hard punish in this game due to the unstaling and the degree to which you can decide over your follow-up position. So he doesn't have a uh, great uh, like um, attacking alternatives. So he doesn't really dash up down tilt because his dash is pretty slow. He can dash up like rising jab, but like, you know, the range on that is pretty weak. So like dash attack is pretty good, but in terms of attacking timing, he doesn't have a lot of mix ups, right? Yeah, dash grab. Um, dash grab is again, uh, pretty committal, right? Uh, so in that sense, it's not, it's not a bad move, right? But it's pretty committal, uh, requires iron to convert off off, right? Which is also important to understand and, uh, doesn't combo past early percents. So reward is relatively low. Okay. Then of course for minecart requires iron and generally relatively reactable, right? Unless you're, you're hard committing. And then for roll again. Like, no hitbox, and, uh, pretty committal. So this comes strategies in what context? It's just generally what Steve does in neutral, right? He runs away, he starts mining. So, now that you have an idea of, like, what the weakness, what the opportunity costs are of a lot of his tools, you at least, like, you have a good idea of basically the context in which the strategy exists, right? So, we start by understanding opportunity costs. Very important. So, what we under need to understand now is to understand the uh, context of the option in terms of the opponent's other strategies, okay? So if you think about this, okay, we have this idea of, okay, how do we deal with Steve mining and trying to like counter our pressure when we start mining? Now we need to understand, okay, so what other things can Steve do, right? And then we get to, well, the most obvious one being, uh, getting close and CQC you to death, right? Run up, up till fuck you up. Um, some other things that are important for Steve is, of course, like raw with punishing. So what we talked about in this situation is like, oh, what if he mines and then like from a mine tries to get out? What if he looks for just a raw with punish, right? Also very important. And then finally, something that I think is very important for Steve is, um, well, basically tricks. And I think it's a little bit hard to, uh, again, Steve is like basically the hardest example to uh, to use for, for this for this lesson, which is why I used it, because I think it's good to show that it even works against a character like this. But tricks is like, you, you can see when Steve's are looking for tricks because they start to do things that basically don't exist in the context of mining or CQC, et cetera, et cetera. Tricks is like when they start doing blocks or uh, be reverse blocks for movement, uh, you know, when they're out of, or, 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 you know, like they can, they can do a lot of, you know, a lot of, like, cheeky little Steve things, basically. That's what it comes down to. So, now we just know, just understand, like, the strategy in and of itself. We also understand the, the the concept of the other strategies. As soon as you see blocks, it starts... Exactly! When you see him placing blocks, that's not him trying to play neutral, unless it's, like, a wall, right? When it's a wall, like, I get it. Um, but generally, if you see, like, blocks in any sort of other, um, 
construction or, or, or sort of like pattern, then it's it, it's going to be some sort of trick, right? So what we need to do now is now that we understand like the strategy, the other strategies, ideally we understand the opportunity cost of the other strategies as well, right? Now we move on and we start to understand or uh, understand general strengths and weaknesses, okay? So when you think about like mining and anti like anti approach as kind of like a a, a go to game plan that we got to play around, um, like if you compare Ganondorf doing that to, for example, like Sheik doing that, you would get like two very different characters, right? Because one is like fast, one is frame data, etc., etc. You gotta understand understand the characters' strengths and weaknesses. So I'll give you another example, right? S Snake. So we talk about Snake. Uh, a decent amount on this channel because you know I know a lot about Snake. Uh, counter strategies are very important against Snake. We talked about it before. So Snake has his standard game plan of using grenades and then trapping you and kind of anti approaching you with dash track and like run up down tilts, etc., etc. Right? And that strategy in and of itself is like you know there's a lot that you can do about it, but it's also important to understand that it exists in the context of um, of Snake as a character, right? So like. The way he uses dash tech in the context of the strategy is one thing, but the way he uses dash tech in the context of his as a character is another thing, right? And the same goes for Steve, right? So we think about Steve, like one of his main weaknesses is that like generally he struggles to contest mid ranges. Or another thing that to keep in mind is that he is, uh, you know, this advantage is strong, but relies on iron. So knowing that he relies on iron, uh, it, it changes how you should tackle this strategy. Because if Iron is not impactful, then him mining isn't a big deal. But now that we know, oh, Iron is actually really important in terms of Steve's moveset, we actually understand that, like, hey, we need to actually, like, we're kind of, like, forced to put some pressure on him to prevent him from getting more and more Iron. So there's some strengths and weaknesses we got to understand. Of course, some other strengths is, like, for example, uh, if they mine a lot, they, they get Diamond, right? So very important to understand that, ev that eventuality of Diamond. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that like uh, Steve has insane combos, right? So we we have to understand that like the the mix-up for him going for close quarters is actually extremely important. And if he's playing this play style, it's actually not a big deal because well, I mean it is, but you know, ha hang on for a second. It's actually not a big deal on the micro skill because he's not getting his high reward combos. Whereas with other things he would. So. If we play around these other play styles and let him get away with doing this, then we're never gonna get caught up by like a crazy Steve combo, generally. Of course, there's, you know, like he can mix it up by going for CQC, etc. But that's like the mix up, right? So again, uh, this is important to understand, like what should we be focusing on countering? So let's go to step four. And that is comparing their tools or their strengths and weaknesses to yours, okay? So let's write that down here. So we got the step-by-step -step going on here. So we're gonna turn this into a list. Uh, compare their strengths slash weaknesses to yours. And this is actually like the part where it gets really hard. Um, and I know like the first part is probably the hardest when you understand like, opportunity costs. Like I know all of this so I can write it out quickly, but a lot of this is like a lot of research and figuring it out and like comparing to, to what you can do, right? So we're going through quickly, but it's actually a really hard step to me because um, this is a very uh, abstract comparison that you're making. So I'll give you an example, right? So uh, Steve weakness, struggle to contest mid range. Okay, let's say I'm Greninja. How, like, how, how does my mid range stack up to theirs, right? Because like he might struggle to contest mid range, but if my mid range is not that strong, then uh, is it really worth like still going for it? Or are there other things that I can abuse in this tool set um, that uh, that would lead to me getting like neutral wins, right? Um, he, he's also generally pretty committal in how he beats shields, I think. He can like up tilt if he gets close, right? Um, but his dash grab is pretty committal, which makes it a little bit harder to beat shields. And um, you know, so in, in that sense, shielding against is pretty good. So maybe it's something you want to rely on if you're playing something like Game & Watch, right? Because Game & Watch can up the up tilt, um, or uh, I mean, depending on when the shield gets hit. Um, 
but, but he generally like gets to pressure in those situations and he can avoid the grabs and then like that smash you so like you got to think about like how do my strengths and weaknesses compare to his so if i'm also weak in the mid-range i should be doing something else or if i'm if i'm strong in the mid-range i should be playing that so we think about like again i can give you another example we'll go back to snake snake is pretty slow right maybe i'm really fast so that means that i often get to decide the range we play at okay that's really good to know so what range do i want to play at well he's pretty slow his mid-range is not the greatest I should be playing mid-range. However, he still has like a dash tag to contest the mid-range. What? How do you counter dash tag? Well, the opportunity cost for a dash tag. Then we go back to what we think the thought about here, right? Opportunity costs. Well, the opportunity cost for that move is that like it's really good at covering the ground, but it's relatively bad at covering the air. So if you have a really good jump game, you can rely on that against Snake. But if you don't have that, if you're a ground character like yourself, like you're playing Little Mac, then the way you go about approaching that situation is entirely different, right? And again, like a, a weakness for Snake is that he struggles at covering the air, right? So again, like all these kind of things, they kind of interconnect. And this is the point where instead of looking at like some objective, like weaknesses and strengths, which again is also a little bit subjective, but is a lot more objective than a lot of other things. Um, and, and, and if you think about these strategies, which again, uh, it, it's not like purely objective, but you can look at the metagame, understand intentions, and from there extrapolate and, and understand like an entire game plan. Um, like that's like it's, it's, it's all about research understanding and then like objectively um, putting things on paper when you compare how your character lives up to their strengths and weaknesses it gets a lot more subjective so that's something that you're gonna have to figure out for yourself right so this is all this is basically getting a a, 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 a TLDR of like what what are their strategies what are their other strategies what are the details of their opportunity costs within the strategies what are their general strengths and weaknesses right so there's the individual moves which is like the the the, the lowest level and then if we go a level higher that's a strategy which decides how you use the individual tools and then if you have all the strategies together you kind of get the character right and the strengths and weaknesses of the character so when you should figure out all those layers you have an idea of what you want to build towards and and once you're at that point you start to think about well the more practical implications so um right so this is another thing that's important to understand before we move on so step four understand what you're sacrificing when playing around a strategy and i don't mean like the strategy you're trying to counter but i mean like for all the strategies that they're doing so let's say i'm playing on steve right and he has like the standard like mining strategy and then he has these mix-ups Okay, when I'm playing around CQC, what am I sacrificing? What is my opportunity cost, basically? What is your opportunity cost? By playing around this. So let's say when I'm playing against CQC, so that, let's put these um, all a lot, right? So understanding your own opportunity costs. They punish the idea. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. So let's say they have mining uh cqc let's copy this uh with punish and tricks so if i want to counter play mining generally uh like the biggest uh, opportunity cost is that um i'm playing around their ideas and i'm generally like i'm 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 forced not entirely but you're forced to pressure to some degree right so in other words you're interacting right you're interacting now for cqc if i want to play around cqc a big weakness of mine is that like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm staying further away, right? So in other words, um, I'm not exerting pressure, right? Because if you're playing around CQC in most situations, you're basically saying like, if you enter CQC, I will punish you for it. Which means that like, uh, if we grab the pen, and maybe I should have prepared a VOD for this, but this is fine if I explain like this. So let's say Steve is right here. And let's say his CQC range is like around here. That means that we want to have some time to react to his movement plus a cqc range which means his range is a little bit further than that so we're standing all the way over here which means that we're not actually pressuring him we're not actually pressuring him so that's the disadvantage of playing cqc is that we're actually not putting any pressure on right we're giving them a lot of control right um but it's pretty safe now if they're with punishing we're generally baiting so you're playing bait and punish right so you're relying on movement let's put it this way so in other words like less hitboxes means uh more openings in a lot of cases um and then tricks this is a little bit uh, more up in the air it's, it's again like some of this is not going to be super objective right 
So what you notice for Steve that I think is important um, is that all these com all these complement each other, right? Because when we're playing CQC, I'm forced like when we're playing CQC, we're not pressuring. But when he's mining, he kind of relies on us not pressuring. And if we start pressuring his mining, we open ourselves up to uh, to whiff punishes. And if we start moving around whiff punishes more, he can use that opening to enter CQC. So in that sense, like these form an RPS, which Surprise guys, it all comes back down to like RPS and understanding your opponent's intentions. If it didn't form an RPS, then Steve would be a gimmick. But because these options complement each other, it's not a gimmick. It's an actual strategy. So you can see his close quarter combat. This this is again, this is like Steve as an example. Steve is very complex, so there's there's more nuance to it than this, but this is a really good starting point for anyone playing at Steve. Is to understand that these are the things that Steve wants to do, and these are the way that you beat the things that he wants to do. Um, now, the thing about understanding, again, is our own opportunity cost, right? So, in a sense, um, like, if, if, we, if we mess this up, so if you think about this on, like, a strategical RPS level, right? So, uh, like, uh, let's say pressure beats mining, uh, with punish beats pressure, um, and then we have, um, Let's see, t -t 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 -t. baiting uh, or movement beats with punish, and then CQC beats movement. Uh, and and then and then again, right? Like and then if we so so it kind of comes full circle if I'm correct. So pressure beats mining, and then they with punish to beat our pressure, and then we move to beat the with punish, and then CQC to beat our movement, and then we basically go back to um, passive play beats CQC. And then uh, mining beats passive play. Now we're full circle. So in that sense, um, what we need now need to understand is which one of y y which one of these options for us is um, basically the most rewarding and the least punishing. So if we want to go like one step further, um, let's put their options in uh, red, right? And then our options in uh, blue. So. Um, basically we got to figure out out of these blue strategies, right? Like we have this thing where if we pressure, this is the reward for pressure. And this is the risk for pressure. In other words, we got like a risk reward for pressure. And then we got our risk reward for movements. And then we have our risk reward, uh, for passive play. Right? So now that we know all of our risk rewards, we can then like start to actually play the RPS. Because RPS at its core is well, is is linear, right? Like you win, you get you get a point, you lose, you lose a single point, you draw, you both gain nothing. But in the game, it's it's way more complex than that. It's it's weighted RPS, right? You win, you get two points, you lose, you lose twenty. Um sometimes you do a fully charged salute the sun and then you get reflected at zero by Kazuya's like reflector thing and you die at zero. I don't know if you guys saw that. It was it was really funny. Hang on. Um I think it's on Shoko Taco. Uh Lucas Twitter. This is so fucking funny guys. I don't know if you guys seen this. Uh it's in this tweet. I saw that. It's so funny. I'm literally watching that right now. It's so bad. Okay guys so <laughs> That was the, that was a clip. So we have O Ob one at zero uh, versus Kasia at 74. On Tana City is 1 to 1. And look, we fit deep breathing buff. Shoots out. Salute the sun. Reflect. At 0. Takes 80. And just like gets demolished. So sometimes that happens, right? So that's part of the risk award. It's very important to understand. So when I think about playing against Steve, the most scary thing to me is, um, is CQC. Because his CQC is, again, that's where he gets his combos, right? So in that sense, like, I don't want to spend too much time just doing empty movement around Steve. I want to very actively cover the space between me and Steve. And I want to do that at a distance where I'm also not, like, subject to, for example, um, subject to, for example, like, a minecart, etc, etc, right? Um, whereas, on the other hand, if I look at, for example, something like, um, passive play, I actually don't like passive play too much either because, like, mining, um... Is, is, is like his like one of his main win conditions actually very rewarding for him very low risk um, So I don't want to play into that. So to me the, the most important thing to do against Steve is pressure 
right? Pressure is, to me, the best strategy. And again, your mileage may vary based on your character, as well as the strategy that you're using and that you're deciding on. But this way, I'm kind of like, okay, my go-to option here is pressure because I'm playing around mining. Now, an important extra thing to think about, and this is something that was asked at the beginning of the stream, is when do you force your game plan and when do you rely on counter strategies? And that's something that you want to consider at this level, right? So now that we understand, like, basically um, what the risk rewards are for us, like, if you want to go the extra mile and you should, uh, 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 like, you know, any, any, like, let's say you play against Young Link every week, you got to figure this shit out, right? But if you only play against Young Link, like, once every two years, then, like, don't, you know, it's a, l l a lot of work for very little reward, relatively speaking. Anyway, point being, um, if you play a matchup a lot, you might as well figure this shit out. So, you now also, like, also try to understand the uh, opposite in terms of the opponent's risk reward. Now, usually you're going to find, like, very similar results, but sometimes if you look at it from a different perspective, you'll find some other ideas. But let's say for Steve, you figure out that, hey, like, actually, I don't really like mining at all. It's actually, like, very bad for me. I'm playing Donkey Kong. If he gets diamond, he just fucks me up. He just zero to death me every stock. So, to me, I just need to pressure. But let's say for Steve, let's say he's playing against something like Sheik and he's like, I actually can never mine against Sheik because she just runs in and pressures me to hell. So again, Steve, I like uh, for, for, for Steve, he will rely more on something that beats pressure. So what does what does he do to beat pressure? He whiff punishes. Now, how strong is Steve's whiff punishing? Well, against Sheik, it might actually not be too strong. So that means that Steve is going to play more around Sheik because again, if you think about like the, you know, the rabbit hole that we just went down to, um, what you kind of find is that the way that these strategies match up to each other in terms of risk reward means that Sheik's baseline risk reward, if she goes for her ideal strategy and Steve goes for his ideal or even his counter strategy, you know, uh, she comes out on top. There will be situations where Steve won't get to mine, but another strategy that he has is so strong that it doesn't matter, right? So, for example, against Olimar, he doesn't get to mine a lot, but Steve's Sheik you see against Olimar is really strong. So... You know, like, on paper, Steve still doesn't get to do what he normally wants to, but it's still a winning matchup, or, you know, like, it's still it's still solid. I don't actually know if it's winning. But it's still solid because of how strong a secrecy is. So, again, if you figure out both sides, you can figure out how they, how they match up against each other, and then you can decide on when you should be brute-forcing what you want, and when you should be relying on counter-strategies. And usually, again, you're relying on counter-strategies if your opponent's strategies are more solid, uh, or, or more rewarding, etc., etc., whereas you'll be relying more on your own strategy, if that's the case for you okay these are all like neutral strategies um what i think is important to also think about in terms of uh this whole story is the um the effects of player reads on strategies okay so what i mean by this is that um some strategies are more vulnerable to player reads than others and what I mean by that is, for example, um, a Sheik is more vulnerable to reads if they play aggressively than a Greninja. And the reason for that is that Greninja is super, like, slippery, right? A Sheik can also be slippery, but Sheik just doesn't have as much disjoint, as much vertical uh, jumping uh, capabilities, uh, as much, uh, you know, as much... Um, threat in terms of for example like Greninja doing like a down tilt up smash so like Sheik is more vulnerable to reads because she gets to punish slash hard because again like Greninja like you miss a read you get down tilt up smash right etc etc um but on the other hand you can also say like um a Greninja is easier to read if they play aggressively than a Sheik and the reason for that is that he, he can play aggressively but how many tools does it really have to play that aggression and um, the answer is not a lot. So as you can see, there's like multiple uh, axes on which you can judge, you know, how vulnerable strategy is to reads. So if you think about Shulk, for example, like Shulk doesn't have really good empty land mix-ups, right? So in that sense, he's a little bit easier to read uh, if he relies on a walling playstyle. Um, the same goes for something like Sephiroth, right? Um, a, a Diddy is generally also a little bit easier to read than most characters because he wants, like he has a few options that are extremely strong and he wants them relatively consistently. So that's what you gotta think about is you gotta think about, you know, the vulnerability, how easy it is to read, you know, like best and worst case scenarios, etc., etc. Also how impactful reads are, right? So like if you read, if you get a read as a Sheik, it's gonna be less impactful than if you get a read as a Ganondorf, right? 
So there's a lot of axes that you can think like this is basically the, the human element, right? Very, very context dependent. This is um, so that's why I actually cannot give you like a lot of system to think about with regards to like creating counter strategies and thinking about how uh, these elements play into it because it's going to be dependent on the player, on the character, on the opposing character, etc. etc. But this whole idea of like basically figuring out okay, so what are the opportunity costs? Where are the weaknesses in these strategies? Um, what are the other strategies that kind of like create the, you know, the characters, uh, you know, like when I put them all together, this is basically what the character does. Um, and then like you understand the general strengths and weaknesses. So like stats, right. Or patterns in their play. And then you compare that to yours. And then from there you understand, okay, so what am I sacrificing? What are my opportunity costs when I'm trying to play around their strategies, knowing what their weaknesses and strengths are. Right. Um, and then you start to just like compare create the rps understand the rps and go from there and then like let's say you get into a tournament and they do something they use a strategy that you're not used to then like that is really good because now you can add a new strategy to your uh understanding of the uh interactions and from there you can you know create further develop your model and the nice thing is that a lot of these strategies are generally um universal right as you can see something like pressure universal with fun is universal Movement universal, CQC, a little bit less, but also a little bit of universal. Mining is very unique, which is why, again, which is why playing around Steve is a lot more specific than um, than a lot of other characters because there's a lot of uniqueness to his strategies, right? So the way Steve CQCs is different than something like a Lucina because it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's that much stronger. Um, and the same could be said for something like Wario, right? So like, War like one of Wario's strategies might be to just wait for you because he's gonna get his waft. Other characters cannot just, quote unquote, just wait for you, if you know what I mean. So I want you guys to keep that in mind um, when creating your counter strategies. So that's what I have to say about counter strategies. I feel like this really encapsulates most, if not everything there is to say about it. Again, it's it's an interesting topic. It's not a super um, broad topic, but it is a pretty deep topic. Do you guys have any questions about the way, um, the way I look at strategies and um is everything clear like are there things that you guys feel like i should be explaining a little bit more so when would you choose to prioritize a contract over first in your own game like anyway. yeah so we talked about that we talked about that quality so what i was saying is that you got to understand the risk reward of your strategy and the risk reward of your opponent's strategy and if your risk reward is like significantly better then you can force your own strategy Whereas if their risk reward is significantly better and you should focus on playing around their strategy. And that's not just in the context of like one strategy against the other, but in the context of all the strategies put together. So if like, if your specific strategy has a better risk reward than their, like let's say your pressure has a better risk reward than their mining, then that's nice. But if their counter to your pressure has a better, like an amazing risk reward, then you might still not want to do it, right? So let's say you're playing, again, you're playing Sheik, and you want to play against um, Steve, and he uses his qu close quarter com combat to counteract your pressure. And if he hits like something in CQC, um, you die at like 60. Then you probably still want to play around his strategy more because you're, you know, you failing is just so significant. So it's not just about your strategy against his, but also understanding how it exists in the context of his possible counter strategies. Can you form a counter strategy mid set? You could. It would be hard though. I think it's hard to do so. The thing about forming a counter strategy mid-set is that, like, again, as we kind of outlined, a lot of understanding counter strategies is kind of having a good grasp of risk, risk award, uh, which usually uh, means that you've kind of like researched it beforehand. Uh, understanding the risk award and consequences of your actions in a matchup that you're not super familiar with is just really hard, honestly, on the, on, on the fly. So um, I would say it's not really possible. What is a bait? It's basically like using your movement to show a certain intention while you're actually not intending to do that. So for example, when you jump forward, you you show that you are aggressing, but if you then empty land, that's actually not an aggressive option, right? Or if you jump, you show a landing aerial, but if you then empty land, it's not actually an empty aerial. If you dash back, you show defense, but if you then dash deck forwards, you show defense, but then you actually aggress. So that 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 those are like some base that you can apply math. 
Hope you guys enjoyed that seminar on counter strategies and adaptation. I know it's a lot to process, but it's really useful and I really recommend that you sit down and really think about these ideas, not just on a character level, but also on a meta level, right? So like locally, what are you dealing with and how can you specifically create strategies to counter your local threats? For today's fun fact, this is actually a really interesting one. Did you know that every spot dodge, well, not every, but there are different classes of spot dodges. So we know how there's different speeds of air dodges, right? So some characters like Young Link gets a frame two air dodge, whereas a character like Bowser gets a frame four air dodge. Uh, so this allows you to combo Bowser, Donkey Kong, characters like that harder than a character like Young Link. However, this also goes for spot dodges. So characters like Young Link, Zero Suit, Diddy, Pikachu, they also get faster spot dodges and better spot dodge cancels because of it as compared to characters like Bowser and Donkey Kong, etc. So that's something that you want to keep in mind when fighting these characters. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, be sure to support the video if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys next time. Stay smart.